those people become national heroes. Overnight. Right. <laughs> you can see how young he looks in this card. You're listening to the Coming to America Baseball.com podcast. And now, your host, Philip Riccobono. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first Coming to America Baseball.com podcast of 2015. It's been a while, but for good reason. I became a dad this year, so I don't have as much time to devote to you and to uh, giving you baseball around the Pacific Rim. But I'm joined this week by a very good friend of mine who's gotten me my start here in Nagoya in, uh, in living here and getting acclimated. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Paul Tanner. Paul, thanks for joining the podcast. Sure. It's a pleasure to be here. And like all guests, you receive a ComingToAmericaBaseball.com podcast t-shirt. Cool. Thank you, wow. Paul. Yeah, thanks, thanks for coming on. Thanks very much. It's my pleasure. Well, we got a lot to talk about here. We're in the hometown of Ichiro Suzuki's high school. He grew up nearby to Toyoyama, uh, but he went to high school about five minutes from here. We'll talk about that and also take a look at Paul's uh, uh, very interesting baseball card collection. He's got Japanese cards and American cards, MLB cards, and also, we're also in the city uh, where one of my favorite films, a cult classic, Mr. Baseball, was shot. And this man right here was on location, part of the movie. Did you get a, did you get a, uh, a, uh, a credit at the end? No, no, no. Oh, well, <laughs> uh, what are you going to do? But he was there, and we'll talk about that and more on this week's Coming to America Baseball.com podcast. Stay tuned. First thing we want to talk about here, Paul, 1992, a movie came out with Tom Selleck and the late, great Ken Takakota, um, who starred in a lot of uh, Yakuza films. And uh, Tom Selleck did have a baseball background. Mr. Baseball, shot right here in Nagoya. Um, it, it opened my eyes to the cultural differences in baseball between America and the United States and also cultural differences that you and I experience every day here living in Japan as foreigners. But what do you remember about that movie and what do you take away from that movie? I really enjoyed the movie. First, my part in the movie was very small. Uh, while they were filming some baseball scenes, I was on hand in the stands at the old uh, Nagoya Stadium. And um, I had some opportunities to take part in a bar scene and uh, it just didn't fit into my schedule. What I found out, even though I was just an extra, one of many people in the stands, it took about eight hours of, uh, uh, of time yeah. um, to film what was probably two or three minutes in the movie. What, where, where were you exactly in the stands and what did you see? You, I remember you telling me something about uh, the baseballs. Uh, you know, we, what, we perceived them to be hit out of the park, but it was a little bit different. <laughs> well, uh, I saw Tom Selleck up at bat, mm -hmm. and uh, by the way, he is actually a, quite a good ball player. He used to go, he's a Detroit Tigers fan, yep. as am I, mm -hmm. and he used to go to lots of Tiger games. They, for a while, they were calling him Magnum BP. <laughs> he, he attended so many games uh, um, and took batting practice around the major leagues. Um, so he he was a really a good um, baseball player, but uh, there were some scenes where he was required to hit home runs. So we saw him up to bat swinging, and of course watching from I didn't have a script or anything in the outfield. Um, um, a few scenes later, there's somebody standing in the in the middle of. Uh, left field throwing baseballs out to the stands and, and telling everybody to clap and cheer um, so uh, the the home run that he hit and at that time was uh, was thrown by one of the staff members did you spot Ken Takakura there I didn't see him I don't think he was there for the for that part of the filming okay. although I'm a big fan of his one he speaks English very yes. well and I first heard of him in a, in a, not the Yakuza movies, but um, another English language movie, Black Rain. Yes. Yeah, he was he was excellent. Right, Michael Douglas. Right, a, right. A classic. Andy, Andy Garcia. So, uh, 
We couldn't find you couldn't find any uh, relics from the movie, but uh, didn't they give you something? Oh, they gave uh, got a T-shirt, um, uh, lots of uh, like bumper stickers and things like that. Remember, it took probably two years for that for that movie to come out after the filming, so I didn't know too much about it. When it finally did come out, I really really enjoyed it. They did a very fine job, I think, looking at some of the cultural differences between Japan and uh, uh, American baseball, and also cultural difference, just American versus Japan. Yeah, we, we see that all the time. You go to the ballpark, they have sushi, ramen noodles, things like, you know, very exotic things for American people. And uh, I'm not sure some of the stadiums might not even carry hot dogs and, and Cracker Jacks and stuff like that here. <laughs> uh, it's pretty hard to find. You're more yeah. likely to find a cup ramen than, uh, than hot dogs. Your first game here, watching baseball in Japan in, in person in the stadium what went through your mind uh, were, were you surprised were you curious what was it uh, a couple things hit me one the the craziness of the the people in the outfield the bands every inning with the cheerleaders uh, the bands playing a song for, an approach song for every player uh, pretty excited from that part of the stadium um, but from where I was sitting, it was a little more uh, calm and um, low key. I think there's less drama when the game starts. Yeah. Compared with U.S., you got um, in Major League Baseball, you got the Star Spangled Banner, and something about that tells you that that the game has started. And it brings its own excitement. Seventh inning stretch. There's nothing quite like that here. Well, you got the balloons that they let off. <laughs> <laughs> Which uh, a lot of people joke around as uh, sort of uh, some double entendres there and whatnot. <laughs> but yeah, that's an interesting thing. If you ever come to a game in Japan, uh, people will release balloons all at the same time and they fly up into. Uh, then they drop. There's no helium, or maybe very little helium in them. But it's. It's different. You got to come out here to the Pacific Rim and check it out. And they don't stop selling beer after the seventh inning. Which is awesome. Yeah. So you can you can go all, all night long until yeah. until the 12th inning when they'll call it a, a draw. Right, yeah. So um, Tie game so everybody can make it back and, and catch the train, catch yeah, the last train. Exactly, because the trains end, what, by midnight? Around midnight. Yeah, last train. So you, you don't want to sleep in the stands. Um, all right, when we come back, we're going to talk about uh, uh, Nagoya's uh, most favorite baseball uh, son, Ichiro Suzuki. One. Okay, welcome back. Uh, in this segment of the podcast, Paul is going to show you some of his uh, baseball card collection. Some very, like I mentioned before, some very unique cards from Japan and MLB. Coming up now. Well, I've got, uh, I got a whole slew of uh, Ichiro cards. There used to be a shop, and after he went to uh, major leagues, I went in and, and bought what I could. And uh, over the course of a year before they finally all disappeared and I couldn't find them anymore. But I got these really uh, cheaply. I think it shows a little bit about the evolution of uh, Ichiro's, uh, Ichiro's career. One, okay, some things never change. <laughs> That's a batting stance. This is a 99 card from Calby. So it's a 98 picture, um, the same stance he's used his whole career. Wow. Okay, one of when he first started. What did you pay for that card, Paul? Oh, uh, uh, maybe uh, two or three dollars. It's probably worth a little bit more than that. Mm. Say two hundred yen. You ever get it appraised or? Uh, no, or? no, no. I I not really considered that. Mm. Uh, when he first started off, Ichiro was a was a rookie in 1992. And uh, he was kind of tiny. As a baseball player, he was uh, undersized. Yeah. Um, he was a great, great high school player. He had hit over 500 for his career at, at Maiden here in, in Nagoya City. But um, he wasn't, he was drafted in the fourth round. And he was primarily a pitcher in high school. And one of the knocks against him, which his, his first manager um, also, um, was critical of. Okay, here's um, Ichiro's first manager, Shozo Doi. Um, 
he didn't like the leg kick that Ichiro had. Okay, and you can see um, they called it a pendulum. Uh, large kick, okay, as he steps into the pitch. Okay, that's re extremely common in, in uh, J Japanese baseball, less so in Major League Baseball. Okay, by the time Ichiro, I have one card from uh, Major League Baseball. Um, this is uh, Ichiro, I think it's his rookie card, um, an early tops card from uh, his MLB career. You can see how, sh how much he's shortened that stride. Um, he modified that pendulum, pendulum kick. Um, nonetheless, and, uh, he didn't really hit his stride until 94. He switched managers. The new manager, Ogi, came in, recognized the talent that he had. His first year, he said, uh, or his first year as a full-time player was 1994, and he set a Japanese um, record for hits, 210 hits in a season. Um, won many MVPs here, I think three. You can see how young he looks in this card. If we could go back a little bit, I just wanted to touch on a couple of things you said there. That he was, he was undersized. Uh, to be exact, he was about uh, 5'9", 124 pounds. <laughs> That's what, 177 centimeters and 75 or 76 kilograms. No, which, no, 50. Oh, f excuse 50. me, 50, 56 kilograms. And um, not, not really the ideal size for a pitcher. Not the prototype yeah. of, say, Hideki Matsui yeah. or um, um, some of the other other players. They, they developed him into an outfielder as a, as a pro. Because in, in, in high school, he, more, he was more or less recognized as a pitcher. He had a very good, he was a righty, um, don't have the velo or anything like that, velocity. But he, a lot of people don't realize he developed into an outfielder pretty much as, as a professional. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and and you mentioned something about uh, uh, we, we we chatted earlier about uh, him him is a is a pro in Japan. Uh, you know, obviously we know he broke a lot of records. You, you all can look that up. Uh, all the records he broke here in Japan. But you you said the, a real buzz started when he uh, faced off against major league talent. Uh, major leaguers came over here in what was that nineteen ninety six. 1996 was yeah. the first time he participated in those, but I think the the real awakening was maybe 1998 when the major leaguers came over. He stole seven bases against them, um, had a great average, and everybody was saying, "Who is this guy?" So uh, it wasn't. There were a number of factors that made him the first position player in in major league baseball one his skills and talents but uh also he played for the oryx which was a, a struggling team they couldn't afford him really and they allowed him to be posted so they could they could get the payoff for uh, for him going to major league baseball so there were a few factors that that came into play there all right we got some more cards to look at well i i like um um, like this one, that fresh, that fresh face. Right. And uh, one of my favorite cards. This is uh, this is Hideki Matsui. 1995. Um, he was uh, um, MVP well, of the Central young, League. Yeah, that's seven years before he came over. Seven, eight years before he came over. And Ichiro was MVP of the uh, Pacific League. Okay, on the back of the card. I don't know if you can see that very well, but there's a picture of the two MVPs, Ichiro and Matsui, together. How about that? Yeah, we got a crystal clear shot of that one. Both those guys, they were rookies at the same time, um, came up in a different way. There was a big splash, a lot bigger splash about Matsui because of his, uh, his Koshien records and, uh, and uh, the home runs that he hit. Plus, uh, probably number one thing, he played for the Giants. That's a guarantee of, of a lot of publicity. But, uh, Yankees I, of Japan. Yeah. Well, Ichiro was, uh, he made a buzz for the Pacific League. He's the guy they wanted to see because of his average size, but his speed, his polish, his skills. Um, hit machine plus stealing bases plus gold glove work. Um, he played all elements of the game well. And probably within a couple years of 
him breaking in or becoming the star that that uh, that he has continued to be. I think uh, everybody knew that he's had a really good chance of being the first uh, Japanese star to a uh, position player to to make it in Major League Baseball. What when he was an active player in Japan, every night on the news was there like an Ichiro watch. He was extremely popular. Again, he's playing for a, a team that's, well, they became a power. They played in the Japan Series. They won one Japan Series while he was there, but uh, traditionally they don't draw very well. They play a lot of their games in Nagoya or rather than uh, in Oryx. Um, and uh, he forced people to look at the Pacific League. Mm. Did you get a chance to see him over here? I didn't see him play here, unfortunately. I saw him play. I've seen him play many times in the States. Uh, always always have, have enjoyed it, except he kills my Detroit Tigers. <laughs> oh. What other cars we got there, Paul? Well, these are different cars throughout his career. Um, you know, all the, the different leader cards. Or, uh, okay, here's a dream matchup. I don't know if you remember him. This guy played for the Dodgers for a while. Uh, Kaz, um, what's his name? Ishii. Mm-hmm. Pitcher. Yeah. A pretty good one. He had some good years for the Dodgers. Um, other various years of, uh, you know, um, league leaders. And plus his regular cards. Okay. MVP. This is 1996. Okay, and uh, boy, he looks young there. Mm. Okay, and this is on the back, the back of the card. Okay, there's a picture of the other MVP I talked about earlier, um, Hideki Matsui. Yeah, you don't see that in MLB and uh, 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 tops cards or. Don no, it's Ross kind of Jack. kind of unusual. Yeah. Okay, one of the other things, uh, there was a baseball magazine. Okay, this is written in Japanese, but it's a uh, Baseball Weekly. Uh, baseball okay and on the right side it's a uh, kanji for shoe week and uh, these two guys on the cover when they faced off in a, in a Japan series and they actually made a card out of it so that's that's kind of neat and who's that on the card Ichiro and um, Matsui Matsui yeah Hideki Matsui So most of my cards, I don't have that many from Japan. I've got a few from 1991, uh, no more no rookie cards or um, OGI's triple crown, but uh, just a hodgepodge of cards. I've never collected cards seriously in Japan. I just, when I come across something, I, I keep it. Uh, I've got a much bigger, more extensive collection of American cards where I, uh, as a kid, I, I collected a lot of cards. Did you, uh, you know, you, you want to, you are a English professor here in in uh, in this in, in Japan. Have do you do you talk about you know baseball with your students? How how popular is it with the the younger kids these days? Because it seems to be in America, it's not as popular as it was, uh, say, you know, our generations. Oh, I think uh, I think soccer soccer with its individuality. Um, Soccer is surpassing baseball, but it's still tremendously popular. I mean, that Koshien, the high school tournament, everybody in Japan is focused in on that. They have a summer tournament during a national holiday time called Obon, and they have another spring tournament, and those people become national heroes. Overnight. Right. <laughs> uh, okay, we're back. I'm in front of the camera and behind the camera because I am the producer, the director, and the host of Coming to America Baseball dot, dot, uh, Coming to America Baseball dot com podcast, joined this week by Paul Towner, baseball aficionado, baseball card collector in Japan, uh, good guy and a professor. Thanks for joining us again, Professor Paul. <laughs> Pleasure or, to be here. Or Paul Sensei. I'm gonna use my limited Japanese here. But we touched on before a little bit about how the country started to really uh, catch on to Ichiro mania uh, leading up to his departure uh, to MLB. How far before he left, how long before he left, did the country uh, really start to focus in on him? And, and, and if you could just talk about uh, the, the, the buzz and the whole Ichiro mania 
leading up to his departure? Well, one, he was a, he was a star in a secondary league here, playing for um, in the Pacific League for a uh, kind of a secondary market, really. Which is like the... Uh the American League. Right, he's, he's down in the Osaka Kobe area, whereas the, the hotbed is, of course, in, in uh, the, the, the Central what, League. The, in, in the Pacific League, and the best teams were like Cebu in the, in the Tokyo region. So. But Ichiro helped bring that back, brought some popularity to, to baseball. Everybody liked the effort that he brought, the skill that he showed, and uh, and kind of the modesty, and uh, also as a uh, as a role model for young players, how hard he worked. It was quite famous. Um, his dad would have him swing at a wiffle ball with a shovel and uh, 500 pitches a day, um, every day, all the time. So, which, I mean, uh, there are dads like that here in Japan. That's not completely uncommon no no <laughs> but but people recognized that it was publicized and he was also successful right. so coming into the um, coming into his own as a star he was still modest in character he wasn't um, he wasn't a troublemaker he's a good teammate just little things like taking care of his equipment uh, that got a lot of press here mm. Mm. yeah I mean he, he's famous for getting to stadiums very early and doing uh, regimented uh, calisthenics and stretching and stuff like that, which he's, you know, said that's that's what's kept him going and kept him in the game so long. Yeah, yeah, he certainly has stayed in um, amazing shape. Yeah. So through the 90s, I think as a star and even playing in a few Japan series and, and being successful there, but I think the real shot in the arm um, internationally was those all-star teams that came to Japan to play of uh, major leaguers and Ichiro played extremely well and got everybody's attention the the, the other teammate the, the the major league pros recognized this guy's a real talent they, they also had a lot of respect for most of the pitchers mm. a, a Japanese pitcher Kuwata was one um, and so when the opportunity came for him to um, to play in the majors, then there was a debate: Is he going to be successful? Is he too? Is he not big enough? Is he going to be able to? He hit 10, 15 home runs a year here, 20, 25 home runs one year. Is he going to be able to hit with that kind of power in the states? No. Is he going to be able to hit any home runs at all? There, there were questions like yeah, that. The, the arm, you know, that's going to stay the same. Right. As a, that as a as a fielder, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they recognize this as a potential yeah. gold Gold Glove player. And the speed that that they knew he had that um, bat speed, yes, discipline at bat. I'm, you know, his on base percentage wasn't as high as some others, considering how high he hit for average. But um, before he started, that was the big debate: is he going to be successful? Is he going to be a washout? I can remember having debates, and actually, I won a few. Uh, I won a few beers by betting. <laughs> I, I bet I said Ichiro's going to hit over 300. And um, I mean, if to, even to me, it was a surprise he won the MVP. He hit 350, led the, led the league in stolen bases, was not such a surprise. But to win the MVP and hit 350 in his first year of Major League Baseball was, was a bit of a surprise. So, of course, the country went crazy. They had these tours to Seattle of uh, baseball fans. Mm -hmm. uh, once, tickets, he went, once he went over there. Yeah, MLB. tickets to the game, um, air tickets, the hotel, everything geared around watching as many Seattle Mariners games um, as, as you could. What was the, like, so after that, that All-Star game that he crushed in 98 against the MLB guys over here in Japan, uh, was there... Every day, or a lot of speculation as to where he would wind up in MLB, and and uh, there was I'm not sure. Yeah, there was a there was a posting. He didn't post for that much. Uh, I remember. It might I think have been it was about 15 million. Yeah, I think 13 million dollars. Yeah, 13 million. So it was a bit of a crapshoot. You know, the posting system is kind of vague. Mm -hmm. How long can they keep him? Are they just renting this player? All that stuff wasn't very clear. Again, um, other than Nomo. There been, it's still a bit of a mystery how that uh, that posting system worked. Yeah, and and, and it was a, he was a, maybe the first one to get posted, or one of the first. I think Nomo was posted. Nomo retired. He found a loophole. Okay. Yeah, 
as well as Alfonso Soriano. Okay. Um, I, I, you know, Soriano, I believe it's Alfonso. He played for the Yankees. And the oh, yeah, yeah. And um, those guys uh, found the loophole and retired. But that was changed after that. You know, the, the NPB, the Nippon Professional Baseball League, uh, uh, put an end to that. And then they created a posting system. Well, for foreign players like Soriano, they're coming over here on one-year contracts, so they're not locked yeah, in yeah. so so much. So um, oh, so Cecil, S Cecil Suriano, Fielder. S Soriano was a, a anomaly because he was actually the Hiroshima Carp had him in their Dominican academy. So he was actually first played professionally in Japan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which which is uh, he's kind of a rarity. So he can speak Japanese, Spanish, and English. Yeah. Pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting guy. Well, Cecil Fielder played one year here. It's kind of a seasoning. He played for Toronto. Right. They didn't have room for him. They said, why don't you try a year in Japan where you can play every day? He had a real good year with, uh, I think he played for uh, the Tigers. Mm -hmm. Played for Hanshin. Hit 39 home runs. Next year, he play, he's playing for the Detroit Tigers, and he hit 50. Mm. Yeah. So it was quite a, quite a seasoning. At that time, that, that helped make Japan more popular right. in, in the states uh, legitimized yeah mm -hmm. keeping an eye on yeah um so by the time matsui after um ichiro came to the to the states uh it opened the floodgates people recognized yes the next person is going to be hideki matsui yeah i remember seeing him in 2002 against Hanshin, his final year here broke the game open in the eighth he was but he was a more of a home run hitter in japan and then went to the states and became more of a doubles guy. Right. Well, he had he had certainly had power. He had 50 one year, his best year for the Giants. Right. So, all right, a couple cards I wanted to touch on here is the manager's cards. And one was uh, Bobby Valentine. You want to talk about this card a little bit? And, and Bobby's, Bobby was uh, kind of legendary here in Japan, known as Bobby, right? Yeah. With the Chiba Lote Marines. They won... He won the, uh, took him to the uh, NPB championship and won it um, back in, well, we'll check the year on that. But, uh, you know, it's going on maybe 10 years now. Yeah, he was very successful. He's a, he's a disciplined guy. Um, he was a manager for the Mets, took them to the World Series. Mm -hmm. um, this card it's, uh, is his, I think it's his, um, um, I think it's his rookie card as a manager. And it's actually quite quite valuable so far as Japanese baseball cards. So his 1995 manager card. Mm -hmm. And he had a really successful career here when, when he decided to retire or was fired or released. Um, he was still tremendously popular. He learned Japanese. Yep. Um, and he was, a very, he was a disciplinarian that played very well in Japan. Uh, didn't work so well. His last stint as a major league manager in Boston, he was uh, disastrous. But uh, nonetheless, separating those uh, the U.S. from Japan, he was an extremely popular, successful um, foreign manager in uh, Japanese baseball. And he still comes back. He's kind of uh, an ambassador for oh, sure, certainly. American yeah. baseball. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he's a celebrity yeah. commenting on the players. Mm -hmm. He does some scouting. Yep. And he always speaks very highly of Japanese baseball in the States. Sure. Okay, let's take a break, and then we'll come back and close out with Sadahara O. Oh. Okay, welcome back. In our last segment here today, uh, man, the time went so fast, Paul. We had so <laughs> much to talk about. We didn't cover everything. I'd like to, before we even end the podcast, invite you back for another one and uh, talk more about this and... You said about five minutes from here is Ichiro's uh, old high school. Maybe we can take a, take the camera over there and uh, show the folks what the field looks like. Oh, sure, sure. I'd like to do that. It's All not right. very far away. All right. So um, in the last segment here, we want to talk about the great home run hitters of all time in Major League Baseball and Japan. What do you got here? Well, I, I want to show off some of my uh, prized baseball cards. Great home run hitters in uh my humble opinion. One, Ted Williams, splendid splinter, 521 home runs for the Boston Red Sox. Okay, and a 
personal favorite. You know, he may come back and hit home runs again. His body is uh, frozen. Right. There's some problems with his family about uh, that business. Yeah. So you okay. never know. We may see him again. Yeah. Maybe he'll play in Japan this time. Yeah. Another great uh, home run hitter is Mickey Mantle. Okay. Playing for the New York Yankees. A switch hitter. A lot of tape measure home runs. If you just hold that up there. Nice. Okay, and this is one Nick. of the this is one of the prizes in my collection, a 1961 uh, Topps Mickey Mantle. Okay, um, a third person, Willie Mays. Okay, Willie Mays, San Francisco Giants. Last or no, the uh, New York Giants, San Francisco Giants, and finished up his career with the New York Mets. 660 home runs. What's who's that uh, with him there? The NL uh, hitting king in the bottom. Okay, NL hitting king, Richie Ashburn. Richie Ashburn. Okay, one of uh, one of your Phillies. There you go. Power hitting guy, Hall of Famer. And then at the top there, you got him with uh, Harmon Killebrew, Mays, and Mantle. That's right. That was taken at the must have been at the '67 All Star game. Yeah. So um, okay, and a third home run hitter. Okay, one of the great ones is uh, Sadahara O. Wow, what card is that? That's kind of a plain card. I don't see any writing on the front of or any... Yeah, any, it's a real simple yeah. one. It looks like an in-action photo. Mm -hmm. This is from 1978, and it's a Karubi. Okay, and uh, it wasn't until the 90s, really, that Japan... Uh, publicized their their baseball cards as separate entities. Karubi, these were inserts in in packages of potato chips. Wow, can we see the back of that one? It's, so it's kind of like a Cracker Jack type of thing. That's right. And Karubi was the they still make them, but uh, um, now they have BBM, mm -hmm. and it's a uh, much more uh, slick professional. You know, on the level with uh, Tops and uh, Tops, Bowman, Donris. Let's talk about Sadahara uh, again here. Not only is a home run hitter where his single season record was broken by uh, Coco Ballantine uh, a few years ago, back in 2013. And that was, uh, that was interesting because it, it, it kind of showed that Japan became a little bit more uh, a lot of people say accepting of the foreign players because in 1985 Randy Bass was up for that record. He was close to beating the single season record and uh, there was a little bit of uh, controversy there. Well, he is a, uh, uh, he's part of the winningest, um, winningest teams ever. They call him the V9 every year winning the winning the championship and he, and he was the star home run hitter RBIs him and uh, Nagashima they both came into the league at the same time 1959 uh, he played forever long enough to hit 800 868 home runs um, and by the time he left everybody loved this guy he, just a cultural icon so for some foreign player, Randy Bass, Tuffy Rhodes, there were um, a few people who approached that record. Um, yeah, Bass uh, was walked. Um, I, I don't think it's um, always a manager. He didn't order his team not to pitch to uh, not to pitch to Bass or um, not to pitch to. Uh, um, some of these players challenging his Bass, records. Bass turned the bat around, right? Like uh, in Mr. Baseball, and then uh, held on to the barrel of the bat <laughs> because he, you know, want to talk about that a little bit. Why well, did he do that? He knew he wasn't going to get a pitch to hit. So Randy Bass probably in two years, um, 1985, 1986, probably the most dominant baseball player possibly ever in Japan. Um, hitting 350, the big home runs, the big RBIs, carrying the team. Um, those, are, those are some of the most dominating seasons uh, a, a batter could have. And unfortunately, it's a little bit tainted by the, all the walks he got at the, uh, at the end of the year when he was challenging that. He ended up with 55 home runs, one shy of, uh, of O's record. Was it uh, 
what, what year did you arrive in Japan? I, I arrived in Japan in 1987. Okay, so right after that you arrived. Uh, so you've been here, you know, 30 years almost, the uh, okay. last three decades. Has it changed a little bit in terms of uh, acceptance for foreigners or just... Uh, you know, feeling more part of Japan. I mean, I know, I know. We'll probably, as foreigners, we'll never uh, feel completely Japanese. We're just, you know, not from here. But how has it changed as a foreigner? I mean, I, I first came here in two thousand two, um, but you've been here a lot longer. So I want to hear your opinion on it. Well, as far as uh, for Japanese baseball, I think uh, Robert Whiting says it very well. And uh, you've got to have wa. Now he wrote that in the early nineties. You know, people like Lee Ron Lee that he's interviewing, or some of the misfits of the Japan on the Japanese side. Uh, he profiles that really well. Um, I think things have changed. It's gotten easier for for foreign uh, foreign ball players, and part of it is too. I think Japan has brought the right kind of players. Um, for a, a few years, they brought over um, kind of washed up you know, ex-major leaguers who couldn't really make it in major leagues anymore. They're overweight. Okay, I remember a former MVP from Cincinnati came over here, Kevin Mitchell. Those guys were terrible. They just weren't right for Japan. They don't want to work with teammates. They don't have the, uh, they don't have the speed. Um, they don't have the, the same work ethic that's done here in Japan. So now they're bringing, they're bringing a lot more uh, Latino ballplayers. Um, and guys with with better tools, younger prospects. If they bring somebody older over, they've they've scouted them out to see if their personality matches what uh, what Japan needs. Mm. Can they get along with teammates? Can they show some leadership skills or cooperation skills, and not the the prima donnas of ex major league baseball stars whose skills are fading. So I think uh, um, there's more information available about what uh, what playing in Japan is like. Um, it's 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 done a better job as a as a feeder for Major League Baseball. Um, so people recognize what playing a couple years here can teach them, and um, they're looking at uh, foreigners who could make a career here and and play their entire career in Japan rather than using. Japanese baseball is a stepping stone for Major League Baseball. And consequently, I think it's worked out very well. Well, Paul, the, the clock on the wall, there's actually no clock on the wall. <laughs> but it's time to say goodbye for this week. I really thank you a lot uh, for everything you've done for me here in Nagoya and coming on the podcast. And uh, look forward to doing some more things with you. Uh, to get in touch with uh, the podcast, you can go to Twitter, coming to A-M-E-R-B-B. -B. Or email me the old-fashioned way, Phil, at comingtoamericabaseball.com. We also have a Facebook page, comingtoamericabaseball.com. How do the fans get in touch with you if they have a question about uh, Japanese baseball or anything? Uh, my email address is uh, meansbynomeans, all lowercase, at gmail.com. And I like talking about baseball. There you have it. Thanks a lot. We'll see you next time. We're going to get this guy back on, and we're going to show you where Ichiro played high school ball. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. All right. That's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's all right. Oh, you make it easy right now. And sometimes that stuff just comes to your mind. Yeah. You know, you go, oh, yeah, yeah. Ken Takakura. Yeah. I am a big fan. I like him. He's, yeah. He's awesome. And, and uh, He just died last year. Yeah.